Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of It Came From Ohio, My Life as a Writer by R.L. Stein, The Life Story of the Master of Fright. So as you can tell, R.L. Stein, the author of Goosebumps and also the Fear Street series. I'm going to go ahead and read the blurb from the rear cover of this, then we're going to go through, check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, as he had a horrifying life, was R.L. Stein a scary kid? Did he have a weird family? Did his friends at school think he was strange? Why does he like to terrify his readers? Where does he get the frightening ideas for his stories? All of your questions about the world's scariest author are answered in this Stein-tingling life story. R.L. Stein reveals what he was like at your age and what his scary life is like today. So even though it says like at your age or whatever, um, I mean I think you can read this no matter how old, how old you are. He's done quite a good job of um, just writing in quite an approachable way. So um, yeah, I, I just thought I enjoyed it as a 31 year old male, but uh, I guess you could be a 13 year old girl and you would enjoy it just as much. And I think that's a testament to his writing skills. So it tells his story pretty much from, from his birth till I guess today. So he says here, uh, when I was little, we lived in a three story house. We had a big yard with a lot of shade trees. My brother Bill is three years younger than me. He and I shared a bedroom on the second floor. The third floor was an attic. It was strictly forbidden. Mom told us never to go up there. I asked her why. She only shook her head and said, don't ask. That attic from my childhood is also one of the reasons why I write Goosebumps in Fear Street today. Lots of photos to out. I'm not really gonna show you them too much because I'm a ways from the camera. You probably won't be able to see them very well. So he got very excited. He did eventually go up into that attic and up there he found a portable typewriter. And he brought it down and uh, you know, obviously got caught by his mum. But um, she just said, like, don't do it again, but let him keep the typewriter. So here's like the cover of his first magazine, The Giggle Book. It's terrible, so you're not missing much if you didn't see that. And this shows you a little bit of his, uh, I guess, his attitude towards, <laughs> towards authority, but also some of his sense of humour. So at the start of chapter three, we have, So, Bob, what do you want to be when you grow up? The principal asked me when we were both settled comfortably in his office. I think he was a lot more comfortable than I was. A school principal, I told him. Very funny, Bob. He sighed. What am I gonna do with you? Graduate me early? No such luck. I like this little story because I think it does speak a lot to just childhood in general. In fourth grade, my best friend was a boy named Randy who lived across the street. Randy and I would spend endless, and I mean endless, Saturday afternoons playing Monopoly on the floor of his room. The games would stretch on for hours and neither of us would ever come close to winning. One day, Randy's Cocker Spaniel chewed the Monopoly board to pieces. Our games came to an end and so did the friendship. Uh, this is something, I guess, a part of American culture I've never heard of, and I don't think we ever had anything similar over here, he said. In high school, Jeff had a little car. The two of us would go to a drive-in for lunch every day. In those days, there were dozens of restaurants where you ate in your car. Young women called car hops took your order, then brought the food out on a tray to your car. When I was a kid, we never went inside a restaurant. We always ate in the car. I mean, I think it still happens. America, I read somewhere, it's like 80% of American meals are consumed in the car or something, it's ridiculous. Um, I don't know, I've never been one for eating in the car. I, I, it just wasn't part of the culture I grew up in, I guess. Even like drive throughs and stuff, we would just go and park and just sit inside. He says, uh, I also read a lot when I was in school. I especially liked science fiction. I discovered sci-fi in elementary school. I loved traveling to the future and to other worlds in books by such authors as Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, and Robert Sheckley. Good authors there. I've never read Sheckley, but obviously I am an Asimov and Bradbury fan. He said, uh, looking back, the one constant in high school was pizza. I've been all over the world, but Columbus, Ohio still has the best pizza. Yes, I'm sure it does better than say Italy or even New York. <laughs> There's a photo of him here dressed up as the Beatles with the other members of staff of uh, uh, the Sundial Sundials, which was like a magazine that he put together. This was when he was at university. He says, they sure had a lot of rules. Among them was a curfew for co-eds. That's what college girls were called back in those days. This meant that on school nights, the girls had to be in their dorm rooms by 10.30 p.m. On Saturdays, it was 1 a.m. Sometimes, for example, during homecoming weekend, they could stay out until 2 a.m. There were no rules for the guys. The guys could just stay out all night if they wanted to. Sound unfair? 
It was. So he's talking about when he was at university uh, and he says uh, he would, they used to run this magazine called Sundial. One month we decided to play a joke. Instead of running a picture of an actual student, we used a publicity photo of a Hollywood starlet. We made up a name for her, Pamela Winters. Pamela was my sister's name. Pamela Winters was drop dead beautiful. The interview included this irresistible offer. If you want to see even more of her, her telephone number is. And we printed the number, but it wasn't really Pamela's number. It was the phone number of the Student Senate office. OSU Student Senate was the college version of a high school student council. We had record-breaking sales that day, 8,000 copies, and all because of the photos of Pamela Winters. The Student Senate's phone started ringing. It rang and rang non-stop, day and night. After a few days of endless calls, the student senators tried to strike back. One of the senators pretended to be Miss Winters. She told the guys who called to stop by sometime. Then she gave them my home address. Next, the senators redirected all of the calls to my home phone number. My parents were not amused. My sister Pamela loved it. Years later, I used the same idea in a Goosebumps book called Calling All Creeps. The same kind of practical joke backfires, and a boy receives the strangest calls imaginable. I love practical jokes in those days. He also ran, um, like, ran in an election as Jovial Bob uh, and campaigned as a clown, being like, at least I was honest and upfront that I'm a clown. Uh, out of the record 8,727 votes cast, I got 1,163, so he didn't win. But pretty good, especially since he wasn't on the ballot. The university refused to put his name on the ballot because he wasn't eligible. What kind of democracy is that? But uh, he got all those votes from writings. He says here, I've kept in touch with people I knew in high school and I have friends from my sundial days. One of them is Joe Arthur. Joe and I are such good friends that I asked him to work on this book with me. Joe is the funniest guy I know. His speciality is sending the most horrible, tasteless Christmas presents a person can send. Every year I dread opening Joe's presents because I know they're going to be ridiculous. When my son Matt was born, Joe mailed us a shop put as a baby present. It was so heavy. It cost nearly $100 to mail, and the poor mailman could barely lift the thing. I'll say one thing though, it was the only shop put Matt received. But here's the worst present Joe ever sent Matt. One Christmas, when Matt was eight or nine, Joe sent him one walkie-talkie. Matt was furious. Can you imagine anything more useless than one walkie-talkie? So uh, then he got on, he went on and did a teaching job for a while, and uh, I think this is an interesting detail here, he says, Teaching gave me time to watch kids in action. I was able to listen to what they said and the way they said it. I think my characters' conversations in Fear Street and Goosebumps are more true to life because of my real life here in the classroom. They do say, like, you should write what you know as well. Uh, he talks about when he met his wife, Jane, as well, uh, and Jane is also editing this book, which is interesting. Uh, so this bit I thought was quite amusing as well. He says, I love the fast pace of working on a magazine. My magazines were published every week. That meant that we were always working on four magazines at once. We'd be planning one issue, writing another issue, editing yet another issue, and proofreading a finished issue, all at the same time. Today, people ask me how I can write so many books so quickly. I always tell them that books are slow compared to magazines. Magazine writing was the perfect training for me. I learned to write fast and move on to the next piece. I'm a very lucky writer. I've always been able to write quickly, and it usually comes out the way I want it on the first try. Kids always ask me what I do about writer's block. I have to confess that I've never had it. I can always sit down and write. When you're, when you're writing for magazines, there's no time for writer's block. He used to send these like jokey memos around his office, so he said, a few weeks later I sent around another real looking notice. It said, be sure to wear your raincoats tomorrow and cover up all your papers. We're gonna be testing the overhead sprinkler system all day. And the way he got started on books is basically an editor at a children's pub publisher called E.P. Dutton reached out to him and said, have you ever thought about reading ch writing children's books? And he said, no. And she's basically said, well, you should. So he did. His son Matt is on the cover of The Perfect Date in the Fear Street series. Uh, although he's saying, <laughs> if I have one complaint about him, it's that he has never read one of my books, not one. And he talks about, uh, he says here, uh, here's a list of uh, things that I wrote during this part of my life. 80 bubblegum cards for a funny card series called Zero Heries. Two computer magazines for kids, even though I didn't own a computer. Indiana Jones and James Bond Find Your Fate books with 25 different endings in each book. G.I. Joe adventure novels, even though I didn't know a rifle from a golf club. Mighty Mouse and Bullwinkle colouring books. Hey, somebody has to write the words at the bottom of the colouring book pages. I received $500 per colouring book and I wrote two a day, not bad. Many, many joke books. 
Perhaps my lowest achievement, a series of books I wrote about the mad balls, a bunch of rubber balls with faces. And he says uh, basically he got the uh, idea for Goosebumps from uh, an ad in TV Guide which said it's Goosebumps week on Channel 11. Uh, and he wrote, he says, I wrote Welcome to Dead House, the very first Goosebumps book, in a little over 10 days. This was because it had uh, been asked after doing Fear Street, uh, uh, I think it's his wife. So he was working on Fear Street when someone called him into a meeting and said, maybe you could also write a series of scary books that are also funny. You know, plenty of thrills and chills without the gore and the blood. And that's how Goosebumps was born. He says, kids always ask me how it feels to be famous. I can't really answer that question because I don't feel any different than I ever did. I think the big difference in my life is that I'm writing all the time now. One of the nicest things about my success is the wonderful mail I receive. There were times when I received over 2,000 letters a week. My mail carrier hated me, but I love reading all the letters from readers, parents, teachers and librarians. It's so nice of everyone to take the time to write to me. Sometimes the letters are very funny. Once a boy wrote to me and asked, when you die, can I take over your series? One of my favourite letters came from a boy who wrote, Dear R.L. Stein, I've read 40 of your books and I think they're really boring. So he talks about editing and revising, he says, uh, I hate to revise, I think all writers do. I'm always eager to get on to the next story. I hate to go back and fix up the old one. But I'm, hap but I'm lucky to have so many talented editors today to help me. They force me to make each book as good as it can be. And they warn me when I've used the name Chuck for a character three books in a row. And uh, some of the changes he talks about, like in, uh, in A Night in Terror Tower, um, the two kids in that, originally they spent the entire book running and he managed to make it so they spent only half the book running. And uh, the girl who cried monster, the librarian in that, originally she was going to eat children, um, but the editors thought that was like too scary, so she changed to uh, eat like snails and stuff, which he said he thought was even scarier. So I thought this was interesting as well, he talks about the TV show, he says, The first Goosebumps book we turned into a TV show was The Haunted Mask. This story came from something that happened in real life. One Halloween, my son, Matt, tried on a green rubber Frankenstein mask. He pulled it down over his head, and then he couldn't get it off. He tugged and tugged, but the mask wouldn't come off. I suppose I should have helped him remove it, but instead I ran to my desk and started writing notes. I knew it would make a great plot for a story. In the TV show, a wonderful actress named Catherine Long played the part of Carly Beth, the girl who puts on the terrifying haunted mask. Catherine worked very hard to make each scene real. In an early scene, two boys are teasing Carly Beth. At lunchtime, they gave her a sandwich with a worm in it. Carly Beth doesn't see the worm. She takes a big bite of sandwich, chews it and swallows it. When we filmed that scene, we planned to use a rubber worm in the sandwich. But Catherine said, no, we need a real worm, she insisted. I can't really play the scene right unless we use a real worm. So we put a real worm in the sandwich and Carly Beth bit into it, chewed it up and swallowed it. Do you think that's disgusting? Here's the worst part. We had to shoot the scene 12 times. Mm. So this is something I think that's quite sweet and it shows how like, you know, he appreciates all the love from his fans. And here's something else that is pretty great. In China they love surprises and they love giving presents. After my tour was over, I was presented with a huge banner that had the signatures of all the kids who came to see me from all the different bookstores around the country. I didn't know it, but after I had signed my name in their books, the kids were taken to a room where they each signed their names on a great big cloth banner. I have that banner hanging up in my house on the wall that I face when I write. Every time I look at it, it really does inspire me to write. And he talks about this experience at an airport. You have been selected to be searched, he said. He took me off the line. My arms were outstretched, my belt buckle hung down undone. The guard took out his metal detector wand. As he moved it from my head down to my feet, he said, can I ask you a question? I have to admit, I was a little nervous. And not just because I thought my pants were going to fall down. Sure, I said. Where'd you get your ideas? Huh? If you knew who I was, why was he searching me? Why don't you write a story about a magic suitcase, he continued. A magic suitcase? You know what, I said to him. That's not a bad idea. So uh, he says, uh, an Ohio newspaper once wrote, in person, R.L. Stein is about as scary as an optometrist. And uh, it kind of finishes with the making of the Goosebumps uh, movie, which I haven't seen, actually. But overall, I did enjoy this. I'd give it a pretty solid 4 out of 5. Uh, as I said earlier on, I think uh, he did a great job of making it accessible to a wide variety of different kinds of readers, from adults to kids. Uh, I think it's also interesting as a writer, from like a writing point of view, to look at how he approached his work. Overall, uh, yeah, pretty solid read, and uh, I gave it a 4 out of 5 stars. 
So there we have it, that's what I made up. It came from Ohio by R. L. Stein. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bunch of video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.